Thank you. And move on to the next one. So I'm very happy to welcome Professor Thomas uh, Schiach from uh, Poland, and he will talk about carbohydrate-linked nanoparticles for cancer therapy. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to tell a few words about uh, polysaccharide nanoparticles uh, for drug delivery as an universal platform. First, uh, why nano? We are all here and uh, I think that we are all excited with nano as a, as a target, as a size. So as you see, most of the interesting cellular machinery is in size uh, somewhere in this region. We can, of course, go below, but then it is really hard to find a medicine. I, I found two, and uh, this is Pico Medicine, maybe for the next uh, conference. And uh, that's why we will rather stick in the nano region. Uh, why uh, polysaccharides? So they are first biodegradable, they are widely present in the, our body. They have a hydrogel structure. We'll show you later on that they are a sort of cloud. So the, the dry matter is really present in a very low amount. Uh, and there are also uh, this hydrogel structure prevents the opsonin decoration of the, of the nanoparticles. So uh, decrease the visibility for the immunological system. And they are easy for chemical modification. Polysaccharides you can modify as you want. You can attach this type of group, other type of group, antibodies, and uh, whatever you want. And as polysaccharides, they may also target certain organs, or probably they can even target the glucose transmitters, transporters, on the surface of the, of the cells. And it is well known that, uh, gluco uh, that the glucose is in, in a really big consumption in the cancer cells. It is so-called Warburg effect, and it is uh, said that uh, cancer cells can even have a 200 times higher glucose demand than the normal cells. Uh, how we do it? Uh, first, we take uh, polysaccharides. We use different polysaccharides. Uh, we started to work with dextrin because it is medically approved, and it is, you can buy it in a very well and very defined batches. Uh, but, of course, we are also making uh, nanoparticles from alginic acids, cellulose, xanthan, heparin, and ketosan. Uh, in the first step, we oxidize the glucose rings without uh, breaking the polysaccharide backbone. Uh, so we have uh, opened and very active aldehyde groups along the polysaccharide chain. And then uh, we can attach... Uh, aliphatic amines, amino acids, or even uh, sphingoamines uh, that will bring the lipophilic side groups to the hydrophilic long chain of the polysaccharide. Uh, it's a, a series of very complex chemical reactions. Uh, we even observed the Amadori rearrangement, which is probably responsible for a very high stability because we think that this Amadori rearrangement uh, can happen not only within the one glucose ring, but even between uh, two neighboring rings, because uh, what we found, uh, those nanoparticles are surprisingly stable. Uh, we tend to have a sheath base uh, uh, bounding, uh, which is very easily, very quickly hydrolyzable in water. Uh, this sheath base uh, we can easily reduce using barium uh, hydrate, sodium uh, barium hydrate, uh, which is very nice because we can make this bond uh, unhydrolyzable, permanent. And this amine uh, bond can actually show us the fate of the nanoparticles without the releasing any agent. Uh, that's it. And how we really do, it's uh, first we prepare a oxidized uh, polysaccharide, then we mix it with the mine, it's water condition, it's uh, room temperature, so no dangerous chemicals, no uh, drastic pH, so we have a first sheath base formation, and then due to the hydrophobic hydrophilic interaction, we have a self-assembly of nanoparticles. So this is the first uh, product, first nanoparticles, which are not finished yet, because the second very important step is a, is a uh, freeze drying of nanoparticles. In, in this moment, we remove mo water molecules from inside nanoparticles, and we allow hydrogen bond formation inside the nanoparticles. 
what makes them very stable. Uh, we observed that our nanoparticles shrink about 20% during this lyophilization. We can store uh, lyophilized nanoparticles as a dry powder for quite a long time. The, the samples, the oldest samples we have, it's older than one year. And simply after, re, uh, after adding it into water or to saline, uh, the nanoparticles reassemble again and, uh, and have a, have a re reproducible uh, size distribution. Uh, as you see, by changing the dexon oxidation degree, so the number of side groups and the length of, of, uh, of lipophilic side chain, we can manipulate the, the diameter of nanoparticles. Actually, we are able now to make uh, nanoparticles starting somewhere from 20 nanometer up to 200 nanometers, and we have a, a fairly narrow size distribution which repeats uh, independently to the measurement method, uh, what is very good because we can easily manipulate the size. We can also uh, manipulate the uh, charge of nanoparticles because you can oxidize some of the side groups, for example, not only to aldehyde but to carboxylic groups or leave more amine groups. So we can really uh, modify and influence the zeta potential. Uh, how is the release? So as you see uh, at, the, at the neutral pH, we have a fairly slow release, it is 300 hours for about 50% of the release, but when, uh, when the uh, surrounding condition became acidic, uh, the release rate speeds up, so that's what we think, that in early endosomes and uh, late endosomes you can have fairly acidic conditions, so drug will be released much quicker. We, we, we just want to avoid uh, drug release in the circulation, we want to speed it up inside the cells, inside cancerous cells. Uh, we just wanted to know, few, know something about the internal structure of our nanoparticles. So we, uh, I was previously working with aerosol, so we use this technique. We uh, spray under the high voltage condition, we spray the water solution of nanoparticles, very dilute, and then we analyze the, the size distribution of the dry product of this uh, electrostatic atomization. Uh, this would tell us uh, about the weight of dry nanoparticles because, you know, uh, due to the fact that they exist only in water, it is not so easy to make uh, experiments. I mean, if we dry them, we, they are even invisible to SEM picture. Uh, as you see, uh, this is the here from the pure dextrin, and this is uh, nanoparticles. So as you see, uh, nanoparticles which are about 80 nanometers in size in water, they shrunk drama dramatically. They are about uh, 12, 11 nanometers as dry. And uh, they are pretty stable even many hours after existence in very dilute solution. They uh, retain the size distribution. So, as you can easily calculate, since the volume is, uh, is changed to the third power of the diameter, you can easily calculate the water content. It's about 98%. So, you have to think that those nanoparticles are not solid. It's more cloud. It's hydrogel, hydrogel nanoparticles. Then we went to biological trials. We didn't actually see a big difference when we work with single cells or, uh, because uh, in this case we see some advantage of, of uh, packing doxorubicin into nanoparticles, but actually when we compare, uh, we did experiments with different type of uh, cancer cells, we do not see a astonishing or great difference. So we do not see the much higher efficiency of nanoparticles. Why? Uh, probably because the drug release is much small, uh, slower. Uh, if you have a pure drug, it just goes to the nucleus and kills the cells. And if it's released within 10 hours, 20 hours, this process is not so, so rapid. Uh, and I think that the advantage of nanoparticles will come when we go to animal trials. But uh, I want to see that uh, if we have, that's what I told you before, we can reduce the chemical bond so we can separately trace nanoparticles and the content. So here you have uh, just uh, nanoparticles which release doxorubicin. So after one hour, the doxorubicin is already inside nucleus. And if we reduce the bond, so doxorubicin is not at all released from nanoparticles, 
you see that nanoparticles uh, quickly penetrate mm, uh, the cell, but they stay in cytosol, so they do not penetrate the nucleus. Nanoparticles are too hydrophilic to be able to penetrate inside the nucleus. Then we move to animal. Uh, we inject uh, the uh, doxorubicin and equimolar dose of uh, nanoparticles with doxorubicin. Uh, what we notice is a very high fluorescence of the cancer. Uh, of the tumor area as compared to the pure doxorubicin. If we go to the real number, you see that this is the background. So you see that doxorubicin is actually mostly the highest concentration is in the liver when you inject pure doxorubicin. And if you inject doxorubicin uh, inside nanoparticles, the fluorescence of tumor is much, much higher. We observe something like five to eight fold eight times higher fluorescence of, of the tumor in the equimolar administration of doxorubicin inside uh, nanoparticles as compared to pure doxorubicin. Uh, then we did some experiments. We also observed the tumor size in the, when we administer equimolar dose uh, as a single administration. We see uh, that it works, but it is not a not big difference between pure doxorubicin and doxorubicin inside nanoparticles. And where you can really see the big difference is the, is the body weight of the mouse. Here is a triple administration of doxorubicin. As you see, in the case of uh, pure doxorubicin, the animals, they just die. And in the case of doxorubicin encapsulated in nanoparticles, you cannot really see the side effect. So I think that's the way to go. We will then, in the next step, administer the equitoxic dose rather than equimolar. Now, uh, we wanted to make use of our nanoparticles, so we made a, a use as a carrier. Uh, we make a microfluidic system and we uh, crystallize the fluorescent dye inside nanoparticles. Some fluorescent uh, substances are fluorescent only in the water solution or in the solution, and some of them are still fluorescent as a crystal. So this is a sort of, of uh, quantum dots, but this is organic. Uh, they reassemble due to the presence of, of uh, hydrophobic, so I think they, they just fold one on the, on the top of other, and we can precipitate them inside our polysaccharide nanoparticles. Uh, that's the result, as you see. Uh, in the presence of polysaccharide nanoparticles, we have uh, very nice dots, fluorescent dots, uh, which you can now see here. As I told you before, it was almost impossible to see uh, polysaccharide, uh, polysaccharide nanoparticles un under the SEM because they consist mostly of water. And now something is inside, which is fluorescent. And if we do not use uh, polysaccharide nanoparticles, we obtain just uh, crude, rough crystals. Uh, then we try to use uh, those uh, organic uh, quantum dots uh, as, a, as a diagnostic tool, so we, uh, it, the experiment was done in, by uh, Stefano Rildon in uh, Padova. Uh, so uh, he operate uh, rats to create the reflux, and uh, 15 weeks later, some of the uh, rats have developed uh, uh, esophageal cancer, and then he used the human uh, endoscope, confocal endoscope, and he's the only person who can feed the human endoscope into the rat's throat, and the rats survive. <laughs> and the results are very nice because uh, we can really observe uh, 24 hours after administration, we can really observe very nice fluorescence of the place when the cancer will appear. At this stage, cancer was, uh, let me try to go back, uh, cancer was invisible. And of course, in both control cases, an early rat, uh, uh, healthy rat, and uh, no uh, nanoparticle administration, we, we see no fluorescence at all. This is really nice result, so it is possible to have a very early uh, detection of, of the cancer. So the conclusion is here. Uh, hydrogel structure is, is very good, and uh, it's very compatible with, blas with plasma. Um, we think that we avoid detection by the immunological system. 
we can easily conjugate our nanoparticle with peptides, with fluorescent markers, even with uh, nanocrystals, fluorescent nanocrystals. We have a perfect stability, which is very important, because in the case of nanoparticles, we know the, all the scientists that work with nanoparticles, we know they are not so stable as we would like them to be. Uh, we have very good targeting pro uh, properties in rodents. I hope we will retain it uh, when we go to human. So it's a promising tool to, uh, to carry different drugs. Uh, I don't think that the, the doxorubicin will be the final drug to be applied here, uh, but I think that we can encapsulate different drugs, maybe the drugs that fail uh, human trials due to toxicity, so we can put a lot of nice things inside. And of course, I would like to acknowledge the help of all those people who help us a lot and uh, my group. Thank you a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot for this nice uh, presentation. Other questions from the audience? Please. Uh, in, well, in pharmacokinetics, in pharmacokinetic studies, do you have a burst release? Uh, do you have a first release and then steady clearance? Uh, wait a second. Sorry, that's a very slow. It was the first slide. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, we do not observe the burst release. Uh, it's probably uh, due to the fact that we have a really chemical bonding. So it's a. Uh, speak into the microphone for the recording. Thank you. Uh, so we really do not observe the burst effect. It's really nice starting. This probably has a lot to do with the method of preparation, because when we clean our nanoparticles before freeze-drying, we use uh, uh, dialysis. So if something is going to be released, it is released. But uh, the solution after cleaning is not red at all. I mean, doxorubicin is a very nice drug to work with because it's red, it's fluorescent, so it's re you can really learn how to work with the, with the future drugs. So we do not observe the burst release. It's a very nice, very slow start. No, not even in plasma, because here you incubate in buffer. Uh, yes, it is in buffer. No, even in plasma. In plasma, it is even smaller, slower release. But uh, we have to check because uh, plasma is also clogging the pores in uh, arrow membrane. So uh, uh, it can even slow down the release. We have to find a way to investigate the release without the membrane, because the small proteins in plasma, they just block the release. Further? Please. What is the typical drug load ratio? Uh, if we speak about a dry weight, it's a between 5 to 10 percent of dry nanoparticles. Okay, if there are no further questions, uh, thank you very much again. Thank you.